It is Thursday. Ah, it's almost the end of the week. But on this Thursday of all Thursdays, it's just an honor to be here on Whispering Hope. And in the house to discuss our lesson for this week, we have Pastor Onisi Lafleur and Pastor Lorenz Challenger. I'd really like to welcome today to Whispering Hope these two giants. And we just want to, you know, get right into studying God's words. And this week we are looking at a city called confusion. Quite an interesting topic. But today we are focusing on Babylon, the center of idolatry. And so it gives me great pleasure to welcome all of our viewers, all of our loyalists, everyone who is locked in to Whispering Hope this Thursday morning. And so before we get excited about this city called Confusion, we're going to ask Pastor Challenger to prefer us to begin. Okay, good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure again to be with you for the study this morning. Bow your heads with me as we pray. Father, we want to thank you so much for another day, another opportunity at life and at living. I pray, O oh God, that you may open our minds, that you may guide our thoughts, even as we focus upon your word today. Be with the study. Bless us. May we get glean what it is that you have for us prepared. Is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Babylon the center of idolatry. What comes to your mind, guys, when you think of this topic? What would be your definition? What jumps out at you? Babylon, the center of idolatry. And Pastor LaFleur, you're going to go first, and Pastor Challenger will follow. What jumps out at me happens to be a place where images and idols and all sorts of material things are, are valued and worshipped more than God. What jumps out at me is that a whole people who are just caught up in this system of image worship as opposed to being caught up in serving God. And the final thing that jumps out at me is a people lost and in need of, of education because it seems like they're just thinking that the power needed for existence is caught up in worshipping these idols, but they need light to break forth. Amen. For me, Babylon means, just as the word implies, confusion. And also, when I look at this particular topic, I see individuals focusing on the created and not the creator. Because the creator is a living being. He gave life to us. And he is the essence of living. And when I look at it, just as Pastor said, I see images and people worshipping, paying obeisance to images. When there is a real God who wants real relationship, who wants real connection with those who worship him. So there is a big disconnect with individuals who have that deep desire to worship images and a God who, a living God who is making himself available to us all. So confusion, that is what I see, confusion and minds that are turned away from, from truth and reality. Interestingly, you know, we're going to look at Babylon, a place of idolatry. And I know we are talking about images, but anything that we place above God becomes an idol. Anything that is first that gets all of our attention could be our spouse could be our jobs we could actually be in idol worship but let's see as we get into discussions for this week today's topic and so we're going to go to our memory text taken from revelation 17 and verse 14 and i'm going to read it as usual i'm going to ask both of you to comment on it and revelation 17 14 reads these will make war with the lamb and the Lamb will overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings. And those who are with him are called chosen and faithful. Here to share with us your understanding of the Revelator's words in Revelation 17, 14. These dark forces, deceived by Satan as he tries to win their allegiance, will attempt to 
to destroy the witness or destroy the Lamb of God, Jesus himself and his people and his church. But because Jesus is King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and because he is creator who alone deserves to worship and wholehearted submission, he will overcome and in the process of overcoming all those of us humans who remain faithful to him will overcome and will not be defeated by the dark forces and deceptions of the evil one. But I just like how we will be called. We will be called chosen and faithful. And so, so there's a song that kept going over in my mind. The harder the battle, the sweeter the victory. Chosen and faithful because Jesus has overcome Satan and the dark forces of this world. Amen, amen, Pastor. You know, uh, it's unthinkable that you would see a lamb, especially the type of lamb that was needed for the sacrifice, winning a war. The, the scripture says that together, meaning the false systems of worship and the enemy, all are going to come together to fight against the lamb. And they will be defeated. That shows the magnitude of the power that is within the Son of God, the one who died on a cruel cross of Calvary for us. The lines are drawn. On one side, there is this false system of worship. There is the enemy. There, there are those who worship idols. And they're here trying to fight against the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the earth. You know, some, sometimes individuals still see that image of Christ on the cross dead for humanity. So they still believe and, and, and think that we worship a dead savior. But I'm so thankful today that he is alive and he's alive forevermore. And not only that, he has the ability, he has the strength, he has the might in war to defeat any foe that comes against him. And the day is coming when, when that will happen and it will be an ultimate defeat for the enemy, the beast, the false prophets. You know, the day will come when all of that will be over. And those of us who are faithful to God will be found on the winning side. I praise God today for the love. You know, when we look at yesterday that talks about the mystery of Babylon, the lesson points out that idolatry was the heart of Babylonian worship. I don't know if you guys are okay to comment on it when we get to our questions. But let's see what Jeremiah 50 verses 33 to 38 and Jeremiah 51 verses 17 and 47. And they're going to give us some ideas about ancient Babylonian worship of images and God's response to it. So let's listen carefully and then I'll ask the question. And so Jeremiah 50 verses 33 to 38 says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, The children of Israel were oppressed, along with the children of Judah. All who took them captive have held them fast. They have refused to let them go. Their Redeemer is strong. The Lord of hosts is his name. He will thoroughly plead their case that he may give rest to the land and disquiet the inhabitants of Babylon. A sword is against the Chaldeans, says the Lord, against the inhabitants of Babylon and against her princes and her wise men. A sword is against the soothsayers and they will be fools. A sword is against her mighty men and they will be dismayed. A sword is against their horses, against their chariots and against all their mixed peoples who are in her midst. And they will become like women. A sword is against her treasures, and they will be robbed. A drought is against her waters, and they will be dried up, for it is the land of carved images, and they are insane with their idols. That's the word. And so let's look at what 51, 17 says. Everyone is dull-hearted without knowledge. Every metal smith is put to shame by the carved image. For his molded image is falsehood, and there is no breath in them. And Jeremiah 51 verse 47 says, Therefore, behold, the days are coming that I will bring judgment on the carved images of Babylon 
her whole land shall be ashamed, and all her slain shall fall in her midst. What do we discover in these verses about ancient Babylonian worship of images? And what is God's response to this type of worship? So, as you said, Sister Makeda, it was the heart of Babylonian worship. It was pervasive. It was everywhere. It seems to have impacted every element of their lives. And they went after it with with. With, with, with a passion and sometimes without the knowledge, it shows clearly that that these images form the, the bedrock upon which they live their lives. And God's response to it was to cast judgment upon the land and upon the people. Judgment upon the land. Judgment upon every facet of their being. Because he really is creator of every element of our lives. Judgment upon the land and hence the people are affected by god's judgment here is a god who is real and i believe that there were times that god did demonstrate himself to the individual so that they know that he is real he is a living god and here these people are focusing their attention on images that are made they themselves made it and they ascribing power to these images you know and god saw the fallacy and just the, the the madness in this whole thing because as i said before there were times when he demonstrated himself and not because these people were idol worshippers and all of that history and scripture you know they, and people around them as well did worship the god of heaven so they had some inclination that there was a living and true god but yet still they purposed in their hearts that they're going to worship these idols of wood and stone that really have no value, have no power. And God was wrought. God was incensed about this. And he had to bring judgment upon the people so that they can understand, hey, listen, there is a real God here, a God who has power, a God who has might, and a God who is able to judge you and to show you that you are going down the wrong path. I am here, I am living. So God demonstrated himself in that way to them just so that the people can understand that he is real and he is not like these idols of wood and stone and all of this. You know, the people needed to understand that there was a real God out there, a real deity that has power and wanted connection with them. So God demonstrated himself in this way and bringing judgment upon them for their hardness against him and um and worshiping these these things interestingly when we look into babylon we see all these carved images and you know <laughs> looking at them today some of us may even find it foolish you know that they would worship stone and worship wood and worship gold and you know the metals the metal smiths the goldsmiths and the silversmiths they were the one who were making all these money and you know people uh, ascribe worship to these images you know it's just so mind-boggling but that's just how far deception goes and you know in this week babylon has been constantly mentioned and the angels are calling people to come out of babylon who or what is babylon since this ancient kingdom of babylon no longer exists this it is very important. This is a very important question. Babylon, the ancient city is destroyed. But Babylon, as, a, as depicted by John the Revelator in the book of Revelation, really represents a, a system with a religious system that is based on human reasoning, based on the teachings of human religious leaders based on superstitions and traditions and based on man's quest to be self-sufficient and the answer to all his problems. Therefore, he dictates religion as opposed to following what the creator says. Babylon represents that system of living apart or worshiping apart 
from what the word of God says. So it's not just simply labeling a group of people Babylon. It's a system. Once I am not dependent on God, once I start seeing the characteristics of folks worshiping just based on human reasoning and, and men's philosophies, then I've got to watch it. The system of Babylon is crawling all over me. Amen, amen. Just as Pastor intimated, yes, the city of Babylon was destroyed and done away with. But still pervasive today is the ideologies of worshipping the one that is not God. No, it's a system of spiritual confusion. You find things, and Pastor gave a, a list there. I would just like to add to that list as well. Iconoclism, those sorts of things, worshipping individuals, worshipping idols. And sometimes we set up these idols for ourselves and we, we can worship our homes, we can worship our education, we can worship, you know, but all of that is spiritual confusion that is set up against the system, the true system of the worship to the creator. So today we still see pervasive and ideologically Babylon exists still in all these systems that are set up against God. And individuals really do uh, partake in these worship of things. So just as spirit back then, the, the historic city of Babylon and its inhabitants and its system of worship, worship idols that were carved out of wood and all these other man-made materials. So today that individuals are still worshiping some of these things. People are worshiping things. People are not worshiping the God creator of heaven and earth. And we always find that that puts people in a position of judgment. When you choose not to worship the creator who made you, made all of us. And that's one of the reasons we worship him. And we did stewardship a few, well, I think this was last quarter. And the whole understanding of stewardship is that we are only managers of what God has given to us. And it's God first and everything else after. But the problem of spiritual Babylon today is that they put other things first and God after. And that is always a problem when it comes to God. And God brings judgment upon these sorts of systems. I want to thank both of you for your contribution thus far. And so I'm going to read Exodus 20, verse 4 to 6, and then Psalms 115, verses 4 to 8. And we're going to ask, what is God teaching us about idolatry from these texts? So let's begin with Exodus 20, verses 4 to 6 first. And God says, You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is on the water, the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me but showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. And let's go to Psalms 115, verses 4 to 8. And he says, The idols are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they do not speak. Eyes they have, but they do not see. They have ears, but they do not hear. Noses they have, but they do not smell. They have hands, but they do not handle. Feet they have, but they do not walk. Nor do they mutter through their throat. Those who make them are like them. So is everyone who trusts in them. Answer so the question, what do these texts teach us about idolatry? It is very clear that the text show us very clearly that idolatry is against the very commandments of God. Mm -hmm. The very commandments, the very simple rules by which we need to live our lives. It's, it's totally against the, the very commandments of God. And once we start going against the commandments of God, we're going against God 
himself, no matter how plausible, no matter how nice, no matter how much we could reason and rationalize it. Once we start drifting against the commandments of God, here we are going in his direction. It also teaches us clearly that the idols are powerless. Feet but can't walk, eyes but cannot see, ears but, but cannot hear. To me, the psalmist was there just sharing with them, listen, time to worship a God who could truly intervene in your situation. And it also shows the hatred that God has for idolatry and idol worship. These texts. Mm. So true, Pastor. And also, you, we talk about hatred. It shows, too, that these individuals are so purpose and they have set themselves up against God and probably is hatred for God as well. Because God is the creator. He outlines to us how we are to live our lives. Idolatry is a clear contravention of God's laws, breaking of the second commandment, where God says that they should not worship these images. They should not bow down themselves to them. So this is a clear a clear, clear evidence that these individuals are, have set themselves against God and they have decided to use things that have no power. These passages are telling us they have no power. You know, and if we are to focus on another New Testament passage when Paul writes there in the beginning of Romans, that these people have set themselves against God so much that he's allowed them to go down that road of believing those things that don't really exist. He has given, given them over to the depraved mind. Because when you look and you, you want to ascribe power to something that you carved with your own hands, right? Actually, you are more powerful than whatever you carved with your hands. You are more powerful than it. And you're bound yourself down to it. Shows really not only ignorance, but purpose, purposeful rejection of the true God of heaven. And really, that's why God has to respond to this. God cannot sit idly by and have people go down that road because they become very dangerous when they want to believe a lie. You know, that's very, very dangerous. And God has to respond to that. That's how he does respond to it, by bringing judgment. Because the people just don't want to accept this God. Just don't want to accept a God who loves them and cares for them. So God has to respond. And that's how he responds. Judgment. When I think of idol worship, I remind of the story of the Philistines when they had the ark in their temple. You know, God really have a sense of humor. Now, every time I think of idol worship, I my mind goes to that story. And so they have the ark in their temple, temple of Dagon, and you know they felt they had conquered Israel's God. Hmm. But the first morning. If my memory serves me right, because I'm coming off of people going to my memory, Dagon is on the floor in front of the ark. The next morning, so they take him back up. Next morning, Dagon is decapitated, all cut up in pieces. I don't know, I marvel because there's only one true God. And these images that don't have no life in them, can't talk, can't hear, can't feel, can't do anything for you. But sadly, there are so many persons who believe in these things. And, you know, modern day, you know, we're going to look at it today. Do we still have people bowing down to these images? We live in a contemporary society. Is idolatry still a problem in our society? And in what ways are people in our contemporary society practicing idolatry? When we look at things like horoscope, are those things along the line of idolatry and when we have these charms and these guarded rings and y'all talk to me i like i'm giving when the answers y'all talk to me what are some ways that our contemporary society is practicing idolatry great yes our contemporary society practices idolatry one by placing i want to hit a controversial area sort of placing my daily job and what I have to do on it above spending time with God. Let's think about it for a little bit. So I have to get out that God is pushed aside. I have to get out because I believe this job sustains me. 
So I have to give this job the best of me as opposed to giving the best to the master who will allow me to do the job best. So sorry for being controversial. But how ways in which people become idol worshippers, looking to superheroes or supposed role models as opposed to looking to God, buying and getting rags and kerchiefs and water that has healing powers and, and I keep that and I use that and I place that on my desk, on my bed, etc. because I believe that my protection is wrapped up in that piece of cloth. How do people practice idolatry? When I go to other humans and ask them to prophesy in my life, and then I begin to take and idolize the prophet who gave me the prophecy, as opposed to realizing that God is the one who really controls my life. And it is not the prophet, but it is God who worked through the prophet, as opposed to idealizing the prophet. We get into when we have all these superstitious beliefs about many personal things. So yes, anytime we begin to worship things more than worshiping God, we got to watch it. We have drifted. Yeah, Pastor, you have outlined quite a bit, but just to add to that long list, individuals who, you know, today we are, and our children are bombarded with so many things that drive their mind away from God. You know, those video games that you, and these days they're avatars, so, so you actually become part of the game. You focus yourself so much on these sorts of things that you really take your mind away from the creator God. So you go to live in this fantasy world where you have your own space and you, you do what you want to do. You know, anytime you find that it's really about doing you and only you, you know that there is a problem because God has already outlined how we should live our lives. And sometimes the sad thing is that what passes for Christianity in some churches, just don't want to be controversial either. But what passes for religion in some churches really is idol worship as well. In some churches where heavy demands are placed upon the, the members of the church, heavy, heavy demands financially and all those kind of things. When you put these individuals before God, when there is this strong, you're worshiping icons, um, individuals, uh, human beings just like you and I, all these things pass for idolatry today so we always have to be very careful in our pursuits in life that we do not neglect to worship the one who gave life in the first place and that is jesus christ who is interceding for us in the heavenly sanctuary so but we always have to be aware of who we are giving our first place to anything we give our first place to we need to understand that that is our god and any time at all, we find that we're given first place. Well, it could be an individual or just as pastor say, a job or education or whatever it is that becomes our idol. So we have to be so very aware that we give first place always to God. And sometimes we want to take first place too, you know, so we become idols as well. I've heard that discussion many different times that we are gods. No, no. God of heaven he is the creator God. He reigns on high forever. He has the power over whether we live or we die, or whether we live eternally or we are destroyed. He alone has the power. He alone deserves worship. He alone deserves praise. So we have to be very aware of that, that these many, many things can become idols in our lives today. I realize that you, both of you, stayed away from the idols that are in some of our Christian churches, the statues and images of saints and Mary, the mother of Jesus. And uh, a lot of the daughters of the mother of the Hua, even their creeds all testify that they support the other woman, the woman dressed in scarlet and and all of these, the false system. People have these crucifix on their necks and when they go into certain, the Catholic church particularly bow down to Mary 
and you make the sign of a cross and these different things. And so, yes, to all of Whispering Hope, idolatry, image worship is still something that's happening today. And so we have to be careful that we're not deceived. You know, the call to come out of Babylon is urgent, you know, in these different denominations. We have people who are so faithful to God. They're serving God with all the light that they have. They're sincere in error. And so what can we do to let others understand that the call to come out of Babylon is urgent? Listen, this world is becoming not only a hectic place, but a confusing place. This world is becoming a chaotic place. It is becoming, despite the best efforts of government, a place where more people are drifting into want. This world is becoming a place where it's like where we can truly say the creation is groaning. Look at the natural disasters and look at the health challenges. And it's really time to show people the hope that is in Jesus. So it's, so as we interact with people in getting them to come out of Babylon, it's not simply to say, come to my church because we are right. But it's about getting them connected to Jesus and his word, helping them to recognize his love, but most importantly, helping them to recognize that the help that they seek to navigate this these chaotic times is really found in the man, Christ Jesus. So it's about really pointing. You see, we need to just get people to sober up and look at this world and what is really happening and then get them to see the blessings and the peace of Jesus. Amen. Amen, amen. You know, I thank you for that, Pastor. Life is not promised anymore. Um, so often... We go to funerals of individuals who are much younger than us. Right now, life is filled with so many medical conditions that the medical fraternity are not able to diagnose properly. We are living in a time that is so uncertain. And if you look at the flip side of it as well, even if you're living the greatest life and you have all the monies that you want, the, the issue is, the problem is, life is not promised. At any moment, we could be cut off. We don't have that lease on life. Coupled with that, based upon what we see going on in society today, as we get deep into Revelation, it points us that we are living in the time of the end. Christ may put in his coming soon. We don't know. So between those two great events that we have no control over is that space that is given to all of us to be faithful to God. That is precious time. And if we do not take advantage of this short, precious time that we have, we will pay daily in eternity. So it is very urgent for us. Lots of things are set against us. So we need to be aware of that and to give God our lives right now. Because those two great events that I spoke about before, whatever they, wherever they find you, that will be your fate for eternity. Whether it is death and it finds you living faithfully, life after is promised to you. If Christ comes meeting you living faithfully, life after is promised for you. But eternal damnation will be yours if you are found unfaithful. So that little space that we do have called time and the rest of our lives, we need to do with it very wisely in being faithful to God and giving him our all every single day of our lives. I want to thank both of you for your contribution this morning here in Whispering Hope. Sadly, we're out of time. And so this day, we look specifically at Babylon. 
idolatry being at the center. You know, Isaiah 4 1 speaks particularly of this false system that is identified in Revelation 17. That woman dressed in scarlet that's riding the beast. And as Isaiah 4 1 says, and in that day, seven women shall take hold of one man, saying, We will eat our own bread and wear our own apparel. Only let us be called by thy name to take away our reproach. See, so this false system is identified as Christian denomination, Christian churches. But when we closely examine their teachings, they're teaching for doctrine the commandments of men. The call is to come out. It's urgent. It is known. Some of us may have to leave our daily loved friends and families in the fall system. It may be painful and hard, but truth is being expounded to you daily. Today, if you hear God's voice calling you into the church that is pure, the undefiled woman, his bride, come out. May leave your loving pastor behind, loving positions that you hold in your church, youth leader, praise team leader. You may even be a pastor watching us. Truth is before you. Choose life or death. We can't force you. But as the Spirit nudge at your heart, showing you this is the way to walk. Please listen. Heaven is waiting for you. God bless and see you tomorrow on Whispering Hope.